Thank you so much for welcoming me to the meeting. I want you all to know that I'm wearing jeans today because Jeannie said I seem stuffy sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> it is wonderful to be in Powhatan. I live over in Henrico County. That is where I grew up. And I am running for Congress because with this icebreaker question, one of the things that I said was, I am a Democrat because I believe the role of government is to help make people's lives better. And I'm running for Congress because I do not see our elected officials in Washington working day in and day out to help make people's lives better. I do not see our officials in Washington working day in and day out to make strong decisions based on information that is presented to them, based on uh, a knowledge of what their choices uh, will have an impact, or based on a knowledge of the impact that their choices will have on the American people across, across our district and across the country. So I grew up in a household where we prioritized public service. My father was a federal law enforcement officer and my mother was a nurse. And growing up, there would be times when my mom wouldn't come home on holidays or would stay out extra late because she had a patient who needed her. And they would say, well, mom's with the patient now and they really need her. And, and making sure that we understood that their role in our community was sometimes different and beyond their role of parents. I think as a child is a lesson that I, I took to heart. And I always knew that I wanted to follow in my father's footsteps and, and become a public servant. Uh, when it turned the year 2000, my parents wrote a letter to the three of us. There's, we are three daughters, I'm the oldest. And one of the lines said, there is no greater vocation than service to your country. And that is really the, you know, the, an example of how I was raised. And so I always knew that I would pursue a career in public service. And I graduated from Tucker High School in Henrico. And then from there, I graduated from the University of Virginia. And I went to graduate school in, in Germany. And when I returned back, I began my career in public service. I was followed exactly in my father's footsteps and became a federal law enforcement officer. I worked narcotics and money laundering cases in DC and up into Baltimore. I worked on the High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area Task Force uh, with state, local, and other federal agencies. And after a couple of years of that, I transferred to the CIA. And with the CIA, I was an operations officer. I worked undercover for the entirety of my time with the agency, and I worked issues of top national security priority. I worked counterterrorism. I worked uh, nuclear proliferation with a focus on the Iranian target. I worked Latin America issues and African leadership issues. And every day I was going out and I was meeting people and I was learning deep dive about topics that were of importance to our country and to our national security. And I was meeting with people and collecting information to send back to Washington to enable our policymakers, our military, our diplomats, and our president, President George W. Bush and President Obama, our president to make informed decisions about the issues that were vital to our national security. And so when I see Congress moving and making decisions without understanding, without taking the time to really look at how profound the impact of their choices will be on the American people, it runs counter to everything I was working for when I was overseas as an operations officer with the CIA. And 2014, I was living in California, still with the CIA, and we were looking at where we would go next. And we were talking, my husband and I were talking to our daughter, and we were saying, oh, well, mommy, mommy's job, we get to move again. We're looking at, you know, do we want to go to Germany or Costa Rica or England? And our daughter said, well, what about Virginia? And we said, what about Germany or Costa Rica or England <laughs> or Kenya or the Philippines? They're all these fantastic places. And she just looked at us and said, yeah, but everybody we love is in Virginia. Uh, my husband's also from the Short Pump area. And it was really interesting because as someone who had grown up so tightly tied to my community where um, you know I understood the value of service to our community, my parents were involved in everything from PTA to drama boosters to you know, the Girl Scouts, I realized I wasn't giving my daughter those same sorts of roots. And while I was incredibly driven to work on issues of national security, I wasn't in fact investing in a community. I was serving my country, but I wasn't serving my community. And so we made a tremendous decision that we were going to move back to this area. We moved back to Henrico in 2014, and uh, I started a Girl Scout troop. Mm -hmm. My husband became a soccer coach, and I began working in the private sector. 
And for a couple of years, I was working with universities across the country, helping them develop recruitment strategies and helping them develop their programs for um, helping students succeed on campus. And in 2016, I worked the polls, and as many of you remember, it was such a great, vibrant day. And we sat down at the end of the evening because we were going to watch the good news on television with our daughters. And, and then that's not what happened. And I realized that at, at every point in my life where I have been invested in the community or invested in public service, I needed to do more. So I became increasingly active with the Democratic Party and increasingly active with all of the pop-up groups that came after the election. Um, and, and in January, I started considering whether or not my background in informed decision making, my background in collecting information and, and deeply understanding issues as varied as uh, the Iranian nuclear program or the terrorist threat in Southeast Asia, how that could apply to our to my ability to be a strong legislator in Washington. And in May, on the day of the House health care vote, is the day that I decided definitively that I would run for Congress. Because that's the day that our House of Representatives voted to undo ACA without even waiting for a Congressional Budget Office score, without even understanding truly from a nonpartisan organization who would be hurt by that decision and how badly. And again, when I reflect on all of the risks and all of the crazy things I did as a CIA officer to ensure that our president had strong decisions or strong information to allow for him to make strong decisions, it, it was unbelievable to me that Congress would act in this way. And so that was the day that I decided definitively that I would run, launch the campaign in July, and it has been a tremendous experience since then. You know, as, as many of you all know, I'm sure, the district runs from Culpeper all the way down for, to Nottaway. We are a diverse district. We are an interesting district. We are an exciting district. And it's going to be a challenge to win in November, but it is possible. And as I like to say, for all sorts of different reasons, the fact that there are this many people gathered in this room in Powhatan County on a Sunday afternoon in the middle of December or January is one of the reasons. Because I'll tell you what, in all of the other nine counties, we have the exact same thing happening. Right. There's no parking in Henrico at times when we have our meetings. We are going to do this, and it will take us all being invested and being excited and being motivated but our district deserves better. Our district deserves a representative who listens to the people. Our district deserves a representative who listens to opinions different than his or her own. And our district deserves a representative who is accountable to the people of this district and accountable to the American people because every decision that gets made in Washington has impact on all of our lives. And while no one is perfect in the decisions that he or she makes, Per, uh, someone in the position of elected leadership needs to be accountable. And I have a lot of experience being accountable for the decisions that I was making. I have a lot of experience showing incredible integrity and drive and devotion to this country and my community. And that's why I'm running for Congress because I want to continue to show that same devotion and that same drive and that same integrity as your representative. And I appreciate you all listening, me, listening to me today. I welcome any questions. And we also have petitions in the back uh, that you all can sign to ensure that I can get my name on the ballot. So thank you very much, and I look forward to answering your questions. Yes. Well, what are your positions on immigration, lockdown, socialism? Okay. Uh, Grace just asked me that question before we started. So the question, because uh, I think I have the microphone, I'll repeat it. What are my opinions of immigration and my opinions on DACA? Um, I believe strongly that this country is a country built because brave and excited immigrants came to this country and built it from the ground up. Um, and I believe that people who come here as children because they're brought here by their parents and this is the only place they've ever known and this is the the language they learn and the culture they know and the friends and family they built, that those kids should have, now as adults, should absolutely have the ability to stay here and continue being a part of our, our society and our economy and our country. Um, so I, I, do support, um, I do support efforts to ensure that students who are recipients of DACA can remain. 
Um, and I, I think that we owe it to them to give them certainty and to understand you know, what their path forward can be. And ideally it will be one where they get to stay here and continue investing in pretty much the only country they've ever known as, as engaged and, and contributing citizens. Yes. Do you think that universal health care would be lower cost and better for our country? Yes. Um, and I, I would say there's multiple, there are multiple models under which we can achieve universal health care. And I am a big supporter of a proposal that uh, Senator Tim Kaine has put out, which is called Medicare X. And under that proposal, that's a public option proposal, um, which is different than a single payer option. And a public option proposal, in, under that case, uh, people would be able to buy into essentially the Medicare program. Um, and as I heard Senator Kaine say just yesterday, Medicare exists in every zip code across the country, so the infrastructure is already there. Um, and studies related to this proposal do show that there would be significant cost savings because there is already the infrastructure built behind implementing it and engaging with doctors. There's already networks of doctors who accept it, and it would just be um, truly uh, the ability for other people to buy into this existing system, which would be, um, by all estimates, significantly cheaper than other options. Uh, following up on that, uh, a lot of the costs associated with healthcare are uh, in an insurance way, in an insurance company. And uh, what, what are your thoughts on sort of bringing them in and making them more accountable to patients and their doctors? Whereas, you know, they're, they're sort of running the show right now. And they're, they're driving the costs and they're driving a lot of the medical decisions that shouldn't be driven by them, but should be driven by the patient and the physician. I think one of the first ways to address the issue which um, Mr. Martin raised was uh, related to the fact that the insurance industry is driving so much of the cost and changes that we see within the market. Um, one of the primary ways that I think we can begin by addressing that is looking at how we can provide greater transparency to the cost that patients pay. Um, and this is a really a systemic problem because uh, if you were to talk to a doctor, and if there's any doctors in the room, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but in, and ask how much does it cost to have X procedure, it's very, very difficult for anyone to estimate what those costs will be because depending upon who your insurance provider is, depending upon what are all the sequence of uh, procedures that you have done or tests that you have done, the costs can, can vary greatly. And, and because of negotiated rates, rates and how they change, the costs can be very different. Um, so a beginning place where I think that we could really begin to make some progress on that would be to try and add greater transparency where possible, particularly in the areas of tests, um, you know, basic medical tests like blood tests and urine tests and things like that. There should be tables where patients can understand what it is that, that they will be paying for and how those rates may be different insurance carrier to insurance carrier. Yes. Um, what is the one issue that you have that would make you get up in the morning? What is the, the, your driving issue? <laughs> My driving issue, I haven't thought about it in these terms. I mean, I want to make sure that 30 years from now, my kids aren't in the same place. I want to make sure that 30 years from now, um, everyone else's kids and grandkids have, have access to a quality education. They, their parents aren't fearful of going bankrupt over a medical problem. That their parents aren't facing layoffs because jobs are leaving their, their communities. Um, so it's, for me, it's an, an umbrella kind of drive but I do think that if I were to drill it down to one actual issue, I would bring it back to healthcare. Because when people risk going bankrupt because of a health, or because of an illness, or a medical condition, or when families are choosing between medicine um, and their rent, that is such a level of instability that upends a family's experience, upends a child's childhood. 
Um, and so if I had to focus on one actual issue, it would be healthcare, but truly overarching. I, I just, I wanna move us in a better direction. And, and I wanna make sure that as a society, we're creating greater stability and greater strength in our economy um, and greater strength in our communities. Yes. What's your stance on guns? Because you're gonna, gonna be in rural towns yeah. and, then, and that's, you know, that's pretty ensconced in a lot of people. So I'm a former law enforcement officer. <laughs> I carry a gun, train with guns, um, and I carry a gun every day for a couple years. I grew up in a house with weapons. I have an uncle who was an avid hunter. I, I don't want to infringe upon a law-abiding gun owner's right to have a weapon or to have a firearm, but we have reached a point in our society where children are afraid in schools, where people get killed in movie theaters, where gun violence is pervasive. And I think that as a society, we should be able to have a conversation about that and look at where are some of the root causes and can we agree that there are people, be they in the point of crisis, those with a history of, of domestic abuse, there are, can we agree that there are some people within our society who either for a time or permanently might not, might not meet our, um, might not be playing their role in our society that would allow them to, to have that weapon because they're a threat to themselves or others. Um, and, and you know, truly when we look at the studies, about 95% of Americans support universal background checks. And so I think that that is a good place for us to begin the conversation about whether or not we're ready to move to that point. And, and really, I think that for those who are responsible gun owners and for those who are fearful of gun violence, there are places where we can agree and there are topics that we should be able to talk about. And I think really the greatest problem that exists with this topic is that people are afraid, people can't talk about it in a way that's productive. Um, and that's uh, unfortunate for all of us. Um, but I do think that there are a lot of steps that we can take, you know, even, even encouraging greater responsibility, talking about the fact that what happens when a child goes on a play date, finds an unsecured weapon and shoots himself or a, a, another playmate. You know, these are things that are, that happen here and they don't happen elsewhere. And we should be looking at why that is and taking steps responsibly to stop that. It, it seems like we're getting um, numb to, you know, I noticed that there was a school shooting. Um, it wasn't even on the, the headline, it was down at the bottom of the mm -hmm. So I think we're just becoming numb. We, we are becoming numb. And in that That's case, scary. I mean, only, only two children died. You know, I mean, and, 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 and what does that, what does that say about the place that we've reached? Because, I mean, those kids were somebody's babies. Yeah. Thank you. And you and then Jean. I, I, I see you everywhere I go. First time in Jean. I saw Jeannie last night and she said, we're just. <laughs> But I, I belong to the Goodman Democrat Committee, belong to the NAACP, belong to the Democrat Committee, belong to the LWCC, and I'm running out of money because mine is not <laughs> But everywhere I go, I see um, Abigail, um, sometimes I, I see Dan Ward also, I see um, Helen Ali, and um, Diane. Yes, Diane Frazier. I saw them all last night. And they all speak, they speak very well, they all talk what their passions are. And thus, uh, I haven't heard anyone address my passion. And uh, my passion is free and fair elections. Mm -hmm. And all of the questions that we've asked, if we could guarantee tomorrow it would happen if we sent her to Congress, I don't think she could guarantee that the next time we vote, mm -hmm. we're going to be getting our vote counted. I know you've thought about it. I know you have ideas. It's not a sexy topic right now. It's not ACA. It's not yeah. ERA. It's not any of that. But I really feel passionately that we have to address that and do it very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe even before your election. 
So can you tell me a little bit about what you can do now to talk about it, to raise it to the level that you can have it raised to? That's a, that's a great question. Um, so in 2016, we saw that our elections were tampered with uh, by outside forces. To address that threat, we need to rely heavily on law enforcement and our intelligence communities to determine when that threat is there. Um, we need our states to be able to act in a way that can protect our means of voting, either by going back to paper ballots, as we have here in Virginia, um, or um, yeah, or primarily through through changing the voting mechanism to ensure that they they can't be hacked. Um, for me, I also focus on campaign finance reform um, and, and gerrymandering. On, on our website, we have comments on this. For me, campaign finance reform is tremendously important because while it is clearly a threat to our national security and our democracy at large, that the Russians tried to and by many accounts did successfully tamper with our elections. The fact that we have large corporations um, able to do it by funding through super PACs, dark money without transparency is just as dangerous. And so I have personally applied to be endorsed by N Citizens United, uh, which is a PAC that helps elect candidates who are committed to campaign finance reform. They advocate heavily towards greater transparency um, within our campaign finance reporting requirements. They, um, with given their name, also advocate for the reversal of the Citizens United um, Supreme Court decision, which allows for super PACs to funnel money into campaigns without any, um, without any accountability or relatively no accountability. Um, and they also advocate heavily for uh, rules that would make sure that no foreign money can come in and influence our elections. In the state of Virginia and in many other states across the country as well, we have tremendous issues with gerrymandering. When we were paying attention during the 2017 elections and you saw the, the graphics of all of the House districts, it's really apparent when they're all shaped in funny ways. You know, and of course, those districts were drawn to benefit the people who are holding those seats. And they're in those funny shapes, dividing up communities, dividing up groups of people for the sake of protecting seats. And at times, it's been the Democrats at fault. Often, it's also been Republicans at fault. And so, while I don't have an immediate solution to the overall issue of how do we keep foreign adversaries from, from playing a role in our elections, we as Americans here, um, and as constituents and as activists and as Democrats can advocate for significant campaign finance reform to make sure that corporations and large donors don't have the ability to wage the same sort of influence. Um, you know, and I think we can reflect back to the election when Sturdivant was elected, the amount of money that the NRA piled into the Senate district um, in order to make sure that he beat Dan Gecker, I think is a perfect example of that. Um, and then also looking towards the next couple of years when our state house does draw the, the lines of, um, of our districts to make sure that they are all advocating for compact and fair and uh, contiguous districts and, and ending our pretty significant history of, of gerrymandering here. So, so I have some um, things I can talk to you about. I would love that. Um, we need to protect the um, individual electoral board members that serve in Virginia, uh, that vote for each county and city. Uh, we need to give them the tools they need to help protect elections, protect states for all, and that sort of thing. Right now, the state electoral system is in flux. Um, we just lost one commissioner by the way. Um, we, we need to, to really think seriously about how we're going to protect elections and give them that option. Shut up, Thank you. <laughs> How do you frame Dave Brett's continual mantra is that we can't keep spending, it's all the budget, we can't keep spending like we've been spending, we've got to bring this in, we've got to cut the budget, we've got to, you know, everything but defense, of course. So how do you, what's your argument for Dave Brett's main thing about 
fiscal uh, discipline and et cetera. I think he lost yes. the ability <laughs> to claim that line when he cut our revenues mm -hmm. by voting for the tax reform bill. Um, and he cut incoming revenues to give large tax breaks, permanent tax breaks to corporations uh, and long-term tax breaks to the wealthiest Americans. Um, that won't, of course, keep him from, from sticking with that mantra, but in fact, I think that um, it is hypocritical to continue with that mantra, having just voted to significantly cut our rev our tax revenue by by this by voting for this most recent tax reform bill. Um, I want to piggyback on something you said uh, about gerrymandering. Can you explain for her educators, Abigail, on how uh, the important role the census plays uh, in the redistricting and uh, how that can be used to suppress voters? Yes, so my understanding of it, and I will say, kind of, uh, Brian Cannon from Virginia 2021 has come out and do, done tremendous presentations. Uh, I saw him once at a LW, or at a Together We Will meeting and also at Henrico County. Um, I can put you in touch with him because he does phenomenal presentations about, about gerrymandering. But uh, to answer your question to the best of my abilities, based on the census and where the population falls, that's when the lines are redrawn to make sure that the requisite number of people in the House of Delegates districts um, and in the House of Representative districts and the state Senate districts fall uh, within, uh, that the, the districts are now represented based on uh, equivalent numbers of, of people. Uh, and so the lines do get redrawn based on moving populations, influx of people, out exflux of people. Um, and so that's where the census matters. In terms of how it can be related to voter suppression, it has historically been um, done that people will that that lawmakers will divide up or group certain communities that are known to vote in particular ways in in, in an attempt, and this is done particularly with minority communities. So either divide up the community so that the strength of the voting block isn't there, or put everyone in one community or one district, excuse me, so that there isn't it isn't representative of the variation within the population, but everybody's put in one group, so they get their one Democrat, okay. and then around the areas, it's disproportionately more conservative voting because people were grouped together or divided to lose their voting strength. Aren't they asking, too, that they check a mark if they're a citizen of the United States, and if they're uh, also Republican promoting that? I'm not sure about that. Yeah. I think, I think they are, but I'm not 100% sure. And, and, and promoting who you vote, who you vote for, vote in the president. Both of them. Okay. That's okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. First, I'd like to say something about my passion, uh, and it's particularly veterans' issues and the way we don't give them the health care that they need and were promised when they were enlisted or and I would expect anybody that I ever vote for to do their best to address that. Uh, there are two questions I'd like to ask. One is, how do we address the cost of prescription drugs, including those that are used in hospitals, and so that there's some parity with what the drug companies charge in Americans and what they're charging the rest of the world. And it's the same drug companies and there's not anywhere close to parity. And the second question would be, what's the best way forward to address a living wage for people that work for a living? Uh, so related to veterans issues, I feel very strongly that when our country makes a commitment to any group of people, be it veterans when they when they join, uh, when they enlist, when they're commissioned, and in part of that decision is that they will have VA benefits, that they will have um, all of the military benefits promised to them. I feel very strongly that our country needs to continue to keep its promises. The same would be said for uh, retiring Americans who who worked um, under the understanding that Social Security would be available to them, that Medicare would be available to them. 
So any threats to our veterans benefits, to Medicare and to Social Security, I think are, are inappropriate. And there is enough money in our budget for us to be able to fulfill our commitments um, and we just need to prioritize it. Cataloging the questions. Um, related to prescription drugs, pivoting away from the Veterans uh, from the Veterans Administration and towards Medicare, one of the provisions under ACA was one that didn't allow for Medicare to negotiate prescription drug prices. And so frequently people who are using Medicare um, their prescription drug prices are rising, um, and there is no ability for Medicare as, as an entity to negotiate those prices. This is different than what we see at the VA where prescription drug prices are negotiable. And so in fact, while, um, to use the example of statins, as a, a VA doctor explained to me, um, there are many statins on the market. Under the VA system, they have a few negotiated rates for a variety of statins, but that meets all of their needs from a medical perspective and the cost of those drugs then become less for the VA. Um, we should be able to negotiate drug prices under Medicare and that would provide immediate relief to, to our seniors who are on uh, medication and particularly those who are on medication daily. Um, and then your third question was? How do we address the problem of not having a living wage for people at work? Yeah. Um, so when we look at the cost of health care and we look at the cost of uh, raising rents and raising costs of living, the fact that our wages have stagnated relative to the cost of uh, our daily life is creating an increasing, I mean, year to year, an increasing disparity between what the life you're able to live on the wage that you earn and what you would have been able to do years prior. Um, my goal, and I would advocate for um, efforts to raise the minimum wage um, and, and, and you know, a holistic look at what is it that we, as a, as a country, and what can Congress do, particularly in the Education Workforce Development Committee, to look at long term where we are today versus where we're going to be in 20 years based on estimates of jobs that are available so that we can make sure that we are training our workforce to be able to um, be ready to take jobs that will be available and ready for them um, to fuel our economy and ideally make sure that they can provide for their themselves and their families. Part of, part of the problem is that the law does not provide for people that are working part-time jobs to have a percentage of benefits associated with part-time jobs. And they end up working three part-time jobs with no benefits instead of companies trying to hire one person, they'll hire three. And if they had to pay a percentage accordingly for a benefit package, they probably would make be more stability in the workforce and they would hire one person instead of three. Absolutely, and and there's also the issue where, um, in addition to hiring someone as part time, many companies are hiring people as contract workers, where they have different responsibilities as well. So you have people in the workforce who, in order to make the equivalent of a full time job salary, um, that they're cobbling together, as you said, two to three jobs in order to make that happen. Um, I am not familiar with current legislation related to. Um, what Congress could do to help address that problem, but it is something that I will look into. Thank you. Yes. Education Workforce Development Committee um, and the House Intelligence Committee, the Select Intelligence Committee. Those would be my two top priorities. I think that when we're looking at education and workforce development, that we need leadership in Washington that is excited to look with a longer view towards the future. 
Um, and, and I think it makes it really difficult on a two-year election cycle to take a couple steps back and say, let's, let's, let's listen to the experts. Where do we see ourselves going? How can we implement policy that are going to long-term respond to um, changes that might occur within our economy and within job opportunities or within our, our industries? Um, and then the House Intelligence, uh, Select Intelligence Committee, because as a former intelligence officer, uh, there's only one other operations officer who has ever or currently serves in Congress, and that's Willa Hurd, who's a Republican from Texas. Um, and and I, I think there's an incredible value in having had the experience of, of having worked directly in the intelligence world um, on that committee. And so it would be a it would be an honor to be able to to use that experience to help inform my engagement on that committee. Yes. Uh, trade. There's been a lot about trade right now. Uh, what do you feel trade policies should be used for? How should they be used? I believe that trade policies should be used to um, <clears throat> help the United States engage in a productive way with the rest of the world. They should be used to um, enable American workers to produce products that can go to other countries, that they should be used to help bring products to this country that might otherwise not be produced here. Um, I do not think that international trade should be used um, in a, in a short-term punitive way. Um, and I think the best example of that is the just recently when the president said that he was going to put a tariff on solar panels and washing machines, much to the um, much to the chagrin of uh, many people within the solar industry, because by some accounts, the solar industry is one of the top growing employers in our country. And by slowing the amount of solar panels that can come to this country, when 60% of the world's solar panels are created in, or are manufactured in China. Um, to, to do that, to cut jobs and the availability of jobs in this growing industry, I think is very short-sighted and truly just punitive towards towards another country. Um, and and the same could be said for the decision to do the washing machines. One last question, please. Yes. Kind of a political one. How do you use these days, Brad? So this district, extending from Culpeper all the way down to Nottoway. We are the district lines that were drawn in advance of the 2016 elections. We are a district that has historically voted Republican, but when you look at the demographics within our district and voting history, we actually have more people who rank as strong Democrats than people who rank as strong Republicans. There are more lean Republicans than lean Democrats, and then there, but there is a healthy middle as well of independents. Um, you know, Dave Bratt is, not a, a, a historical Republican who's socially liberal and but fiscally conservative. He's aligned wholly with the president, who is our most you know, unpopular president in recent history. So when we look at where the demographics of this district and the, the political leanings of the people in this district fall, we are not a, a Trump district, and, and we, we weren't. Um, he got just at 50% of the vote. Um, but we did have a lot of people who voted third party in our presidential race. Um, and so really when, when we look at how people line up, there's about 27% of the people in this district are ideologically independent according to modeling. But they frequently vote Republican. So for us really, this election and winning it is about two things. It's about making sure that every Democrat from Culpeper down to Nottoway <coughs> understands that his or her vote matters. And when I was down in Colt, uh, down in Nottoway a couple of weeks back, people said, oh, but Nottoway is such a red district. And I said, but that doesn't really matter because it's snow and we have like 50 people registered for that. We rescheduled it, now we have over 70 registered. So mm -hmm. it's a good thing. Um, our one in Powhatan is actually immediately following this, this meeting. Um, and, and we are then going to continue across the district. We have them scheduled uh, in all of the other counties as well. Because really, to win this race and to beat this incumbent, it is going to require that people be enthusiastic and people believe that winning the seat is entirely possible and that people be excited about being a part of it. 
And so that's why we are trying to be everywhere because I want to make sure that people know my face. I want to make sure that people know who I am as a person. People know what I believe in as a politician. Um, and people know the rest of our team. Karen is here with us today and, and uh, Shannon is here with us today. Um, and we have other team members who will join at other events. So it's winnable because the numbers show it's winnable, but it will, but people need to believe it's winnable as well to make those numbers actually uh, come out with strong enough force. Yes. What is the primary? June, oh, actually. <laughs> the primary should be June 12th, but the committee is actually making this decision today whether it will be a state-run primary, which I suspect it will be, which will be June 12th or a committee-run firehouse primary, which could be as early as eight, the weekend of April 27th. I hope it's early, because you need to get behind one person. You've got three people running. Four. 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 I didn't mean to spite anybody. You've really got to get it out of the way so you can get behind one person and push. Yes. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you.